Broadcasting from the Allen B. LeVan NSU Broward Center of Innovation at Nova Southeastern University. Welcome to Sunshine Startups Live. Featuring rock star entrepreneurs, bright ideas, and experts on the startup ecosystem. And now your hosts of Sunshine Startups Live, Jim Ryan and John Wensveen. Hi, and welcome to Sunshine Startups Live. I'm investor, entrepreneur, and startup enthusiast, Jim Ryan. Great episode on tap for you today, and I'm joined by my good friend and colleague here on Sunshine Startups Live, uh, John Wensveen. John, great to be with you again. Great to be with you, my friend. Welcome to the world's first theme park for entrepreneurs, the Allen B. LeVan NSU Broward Center of Innovation, a true economic development engine, having local, regional, national, and international impact here uh, and right out of South Florida. And I'm, I'm so excited about all the things that are going on, but I'm even more excited about the guest that we have today. This is going to be a good one. It is. And I'm excited to have our guest today. And the purpose of Sunshine Startups Live is to really talk about and showcase all the activity in the state of Florida with a, a real focus geographically on South Florida as really a mecca for all the activity of bursting startups and tech and a lot of the revolutions in AI and at the forefront of this is uh, Ron Taro, and Ron, it's great to have you here today. Ron is the uh, president uh, of New World Angels, uh, an angel investment firm that's based in Palm Beach County in Florida, has been around for quite a long uh, amount of time and years, and Ron's uh, president of that organization, as well as a director of the board, and we're going to talk AI tech, uh, Ron's background, and a lot of interesting stuff. I think you're going to get some great uh, wisdom and nuggets of information out of this. Uh, Ron, I know in your background uh, that you are, you went to school in Minnesota, and I know that you and and your wife (laughs) probably have been defrosting for quite some time uh, down here. No, no, Uh, no. I married Florida, man. (laughs) She's from here. (laughs) We we had this negotiation at marriage time. Do you want to move to Minnesota? No. So So he's been officially imported. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. 27 years ago. Wow. And uh, you got an amazing background as being an entrepreneur, um, you know, executive in a a few different companies. So kind of walk us through a minute or so and your background and then- Really more interested in uh, in the end about talking about New World as you are mm-hmm. and a lot of the startup activity and tech that's happening. Sure. Okay. So um, <laughs> I'm a nerd. I, I'm a, my degree is in mathematics with computer science and physics, and so and I played in the band. So getting a date. What tough, instrument? Tough, uh, clarinet, saxophone, and flute. All right. Uh-huh. So the uh, son of music teachers. Um, but um, so I, I ended up going to work out of college uh, with IBM Labs, and so I was doing software engineering work, then project management work, kind of moved into product uh, management work, uh, uh, you know, product marketing, you know, what to make, when to make it, who to sell it to, why. Uh, jumped out of IBM at one point, it was selling for a bit, I jumped and ended up at Ernst & Young, uh, ended up doing uh, essentially management consulting. But this is back when... I guess it's the big four now, but Ernst had a full consulting practice, and that's changed a couple times over. And um, so anyway, long, long and short is I was focused mostly on telecommunications and network and or information technology more generally, either what products to make, why to make them part of strategic services, or you know what information at what time, at what place, you know, strategy inside the corporate enterprise for deploying IT. So I did a bunch of work like that. In the meantime, what had happened... My wife, not yet my wife, um, she, she ended up um, founding a company. We had all met at IBM Labs, and so with another a good friend and software engineer. He, uh, here in Boca Raton. In, in Boca Raton. Yeah. We were here in, in uh, IBM Boca, where they built the IBM PC, uh, among other things, uh, Series 1. These are all computers, by the way. For you youngins, <laughs> languages you've never heard of, computing platforms you've never heard of. Um, but anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> so it goes in the tech world. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm a software guy. But anyway, they had started a company. I ended up taking leave of absence from Ernst & Young and the consulting biz to their consternation um, and uh, began to, as a CEO here in South Florida, to, to grow a software company. Uh, the uh, long and short of it is is that I re-upped it, um, and I re-upped it a, a second time. Uh, and ultimately, Ernst & Young, as if you remember, there's a big collapse in the accounting world uh, where... Uh, they basically got out of the, the business and they sold it to Capgemini, the French uh, uh, systems integration firm. They sold the consulting business. So there was no there there for me to go back to. So then I worked with my wife for 14 years. 
Wow. Still married. And you're still married, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> so, um, so Dina. Um, Let's all die. Yeah. After the, uh, working together yeah. for so many years, everything's a cakewalk, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's have a business meeting and not agree. So, um, so anyway, we, 14 years, ultimately, we, um, we sold that company to uh, a, a telco, a VoIP platform called Broadsoft, which was then rolled up into Cisco. Our stuff, you know, the, the moment you get rolled into a larger company, everything becomes, uh, well, I said less strategic or, you know, they continue to move. And, and I would say, you know, they sp ultimately, I think, after the Cisco acquisition spun it back out. So the typical story of stuff getting sliced and diced. And I think we have some of our teams still at Cisco. Some got spun out into a, another company, et cetera. So that's all, all in the haze somewhere. I'm not quite sure what's going on with it. Um, but it was all in the area of voice and uh, telecommunications. The, so having sold the company um, and having gone along with the desks and pencils for a couple of years, I ended up saying, okay, what should I do? And so I basically started uh, investing. So first directly in the areas that I know, which is tech and software, but more generally one thing led to another and uh, ended up getting dragged into New World. And, and um, actually, I don't know if about dragged in, Ron. Well, okay, <laughs> whatever. Um, well, John Cole, actually, he dragged me. So, if you know, John Cole is one of the, uh, the fathers of venture capital in the state of Florida and one of the founders of New World. And so, he also did my transaction uh, for the sale of the company. So, when the check cleared, the phone started to ring anyway. Um, hmm. So, one thing led to another, I ended up part of New World, I ended up running sourcing and screening, and ultimately ended up. Uh, Ultimately, ended up uh, uh, they made me president. So here I am. <laughs> um, no, in, in the meantime, I've done a, a lot of parallel stuff, uh, advising companies uh, directly, either, either as a board member, um, early stage. You know, so Dina and I uh, really have sort of dedicated ourselves to early stage companies. Um, you know, just to, you know, they're more fun than potentates from large corporations. Let's be clear. So you know, we, we just have sort of spent our time in, either inside of incubators. Um, advising, uh, directly advising, and providing services to them or, or investing. So that's kind of the story today. And, you know, I've been uh, president of, of New World now for a year and a half. Uh, I would say it's, I think our, our membership is about tripled. Um, our deal flow is times five. Um, and that actually speaks not to, you know, any sort of anything amazing about New World, but uh, how profoundly the uh, ecosystem, I think we were talking before we came on, uh, the ecosystem in Florida, uh, how that's changed. Because as a CEO for 14 years here in South Florida, if I was hiring a software engineer, I was importing. I mean, we were the masters of H-1B and green card uh, management. Dina did a lot of this work uh, for us. And, you know, we're software engineering from, from uh, you know, Argentina or from, you know, Texas or, you know, wherever it was bringing in. Today, you have a tech company in South Florida. You do not have that problem. You do have resource options here locally. But I can tell you 20 years ago, um, 25 years ago, we were importing everybody. And the more specialized you are, the more specialized the requirement was. So um, quite, a big, quite a big change. Uh, and, so, and also then uh, quite a big uh, change in the investment environment uh, with you know, people moving to Florida for – you know, they'll tell you that they love the weather, but I think they, they like the tax climate. So, the, <laughs> yeah, I had for years my Silicon Valley pals, you know, you got to move to California to be a, unless you're, otherwise you're a nobody. Um, and today I would say uh, they're all living in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of those, so. TN1, H1B, alien of extraordinary ability was the legal terminology. You, which also, I, yeah. you also defrosted. I wasn't sure if I should have been insulted or not. But what anyways, a I, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of the United mm -hmm. States. I've been for quite some time now. Um, but it was interesting how you talk about how you and your wife have dedicated yourself to the early stage startups, which is unusual and unique in some ways because we run across people all the time that are more interested in the less risky, more established, already got a proof of concept, and we need more people involved in that early stage startup ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you're being instrumental in helping move the needle here, particularly here in South Florida. So number one, why early stage startups? What captures your interest there, um, especially given the potential risk that might be involved from an investment perspective? And secondly, what's going on in the ecosystem of South Florida now in terms of what the opportunities and what some of the challenges might be? Um, let's see, let me, let me unpack a bunch of things. There. So, I mean, the motivation here, um, from even from an investment standpoint, listen, I, early stage is an asset class, right? 
There's real estate, there's stocks, there's bonds, there's cash, and then there's various forms of early stage. Um, if, if you look at it, you know, the seed, pre-seed, which is where, you know, New World operates, uh, is that is basically an illiquid, and you have to have a careful look at, you know, the context and understanding what you're going to invest in. Um, should you be all in on that? You know, it's an open question. It's a balancing question, right? So, you know, from my perspective, you can just look at it as a portfolio management thing. If, if you have a net worth, what percentage do you want to have in early stage companies? And you should have some. There's actually an interesting reason why. In fact, I just did a, 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 a letter to our members. Uh, if you, the reality is, is that the IPO market has collapsed, right? And then, so, which means the, you know, the, the D, C, B, A, you know, all these rounds have also slowed down because people have taken money off the table for all these mm -hmm. macro reasons. So, <laughs> You know, you, what you can do is you can kind of go and say, listen, this is a very smart company. And so if I, if you ignore everything else, right, um, you can say to yourself, I will invest in a very early stage company because really by the time all of that clears, this company's got three years of growth, four years, just make sure you didn't overpay on value because the valuations at IPO are lower. That backs all the way up through the earlier and earlier and earlier into the, you know, sort of the capital. Um, so just make sure you're careful up front. And you also, um, from from my perspective, I'm a pretty conservative uh, uh, founder. You know, default alive is a great place to live. And so if you're in information technology, especially, you know, you should be you should be trying to manage yourself to, you know, conservatively, you know, cash, you know, cash uh, efficient, uh, mm -hmm. capital efficient is, uh, you know, a common thing for a founder. So I really think it's a pretty active system. I mean, you see our, our growth. You see a lot of interest, um, uh, folks in, in Florida, in that early stage, and it just fits in a portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, don't get carried away and, and, don't, uh, and don't overpay for things. And also, it's more interesting. I mean, you have a multiples opportunity uh, you know, that you don't really have in a later stage, mm -hmm. in theory uh, and in general, so somebody can argue with me. But I mean, that's how I would view most of them. Um, What's the other part of your question? I kind of forgot. So it. why the early stage startups and what's going on here in the ecosystem of South Florida? So I, I think you see I, I, a couple of things. If you're looking at our deal flow, I mean, our, our, our incoming deal flow now is, is pretty large. And um, you see a lot of folks moving to Florida. Some of them, are, you know, venture capital is moving here, but they're doing it for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, OK, they like the weather. Fine. But the. The, the tax reason motivation, a lot of them spend all their time investing outside of Florida anyway. All they did is change Wi-Fi access points, right? That's <laughs> uh, and, codes. And kind of zip codes and access points. <laughs> yeah, and so you, know, you, end up, you end up going, okay. But, so they're not looking in-state. But there's a lot, especially in the angel world, there's a lot of folks looking in-state. But they need a vehicle. Um, you, know, you, need, you, you find out as an angel, it's very, very hard to find deals. It's time-consuming. Vet them, especially if it's outside your competence. And we can talk about lessons for CEOs turning themselves into investors because there's a lot of uh, misery in there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of money in Florida for early stage, and even, I would say, up into A, uh, you know, coming out of the angels. And also, by the way, something else we've seen is as the, uh, the A round, B round, C round, all this, you know, whatever these uh, phony baloney names are, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the later rounds that they get, trouble getting more money, they're actually coming back to the angels and saying, would you do another round for us? Which we would do. We would lead with New World. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. The other thing we've seen is we've seen more and more applications for um, startups from outside the state of Florida. Um, I think in our medical group. What, what do you attribute that to? Um, because I think most of them have figured, two things. Um, most of them have figured out, number one, that a lot of money's moved to Florida, so why not throw some, you know, mm -hmm. throw my pitch deck over the fence, uh, if you will. Um, also, what you have is we use a, a workflow platform like a Dealum and these different. Um, so what you can do is with a click, you can say, oh, I just created my profile on one of these startup platforms. And so let me just send it to everybody on the platform. So you're getting a little bit of that going on, too. Um, but I would say in general, a geographic boundary has become, I think, a little bit less important. Um, there's, an, there's another reason for that. And... One of the things that uh, when I when I when I was uh, I, I took over from Steve O'Hara, um, uh, he was the president. Uh, Steve was, among many things, a former head of like Rawlings Sporting Goods and stuff like that, consumer products guy, P and G guy, his roots. Is you know we were looking around and we're, we're seeing the deal flow rise and you know I, I'm the VP of screening, so this pitch is curing cancer and this one's a dating app. 
<laughs> and the context switching, and this is what you don't appreciate the, the, as an investor. The, the yeah. challenge would be, can you combine those two? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I could be your boyfriend, and I, and I don't I could cancer. I cancer and if you kids. had. There is an app for that. There is an app for that. <laughs> um, and so what you, what you find out is that that's very, very hard. And so, and also what you do is you get yourself, and New World has amazing membership. I mean, the, the depth of knowledge within this group is astounding. Um, except they usually learn about the investment when you're ready to write a check, and they go, what? That won't work. And so you went through a lot of work. So what we did is we organized New World into four investment groups. Uh, we have a medical and healthcare group, because they do talk funny, and if you're curing cancer, they have a shot at understanding, mm -hmm. right? Um, we, we have a consumer products group uh, that is basically everything that you'd say, B2C in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the basic sense of the word. Um, and then we have a manufacturing industrials, and we have C-level executives from, from corporations that are running these. And manufacturing industrials, everything from the robotics to chemicals, you know, manufacturing technologies, et cetera, because we think that's actually a pretty strategic thing if you're looking at, um, at especially U.S. competitors, you know, maker space, all that. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, we have an information technologies, and that's sort of the, you know, everything that's bits. So it's, it can be telecommunications, media content, uh, fintechs in here. AI fits in there, but the reality is AI is spread across all of these um, as, a, as a technology rather than a product category. Mm -hmm. So we, we took and we broke the organization out. And so now we stream into these groups where it's sort of birds of a feather. You know, we're all from industries that understand the core tech and we can screen it more effectively um, and not go f as far down the diligence road. One of the reputations for New World is, you know, uh, number one is uh, we're too picky. <laughs> right, we don't. You know, we, we we see a lot of deals. We don't do a lot, um, but you know that's actually good news or bad news depending on which side of the fence you're on here. Mm -hmm. But um, but there is this idea that um, we are well educated in it and we're highly valuable if we invest. Right, we have a lot of background and so we're sort of like smart money but hard money in in, in that regard. So can you talk about the membership a, a little bit too? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'd like to hear about uh, uh, that because you have a, a, a model mm -hmm. uh, specific. Uh, you mentioned obviously the thesis, mm -hmm. and uh, you, uh, you and Steve have kind of migrated from traditionally New World being one of the first angel groups uh, in the state of Florida uh, yeah, 20, tw years uh, 20 years ago. So there's yeah. a tremendous legacy and time that's changed. Obviously, you and Steve have kind of changed over the last few years, being incorporating more of the tech. Uh, share with the audience because we do have some startups that listen to the uh, to the cast. Uh, they want to hear from you the exposure. Am, am I aligned with New World? So talk about the thesis of New World. So each of those investment groups ends up having a different thesis. So um, so if you were to look at it, it one thesis thesis does not fit all, which is one of the reasons we broke it out. Is if you are in medical and let's say pharma. Uh, if you're not in a stage two or is it phase two, whatever they call that in medical world, stage two clinicals, right? We, we don't want to be in stage one or because really there's too much. You haven't proven it. it does it does it kill you or not mm -hmm. versus save you or not? So mm -hmm. if you're in stage two clinical, we're going to look at that because you're five years out from revenue just from the FDA. So that has a whole different set of, of things. Um, industrials, you better have a strong patent story. You better have, you know, the ways to protect more physical goods, you know, and so there's things in there. Um, the uh, consumer products, typically, uh, again, in, in no cases do we simply fund a vision. You probably have a prototype of a product. Maybe you got some built, not at scale. Um, we have the CEOs of, of, you know, some major consumer products in the group. So they're going to look at it and say, you know, they're going to look at it and say, listen, we, you've got some proof data off of Amazon as to how this thing sells, what's its repeat, what's its, you know. So we're going to look at something that's kind of ready for scaling a little bit more, or maybe it's close enough to a minimum product for, for sale in the market. And then for information technology, I mean, that's my world. Um, so discount the other three because I'm only nominally uh, uh, interested, uh, contributory in some of that. Um, information technology, it's become so cheap to build some core information technologies that if you're coming at us, you better have certainly an MVP. Um, maybe what you have is a customer, maybe a beta customer who doesn't hate you, can't be your mom, um, you know. And so, you know, this sort of thing where you got to have it a little bit further down the road uh, for us on information technologies. Um, if I were looking at energy, if I were looking at the history of, of New World, I would say that the energy right now is certainly in the industrials and the combination mm -hmm. of, I'll call it, you know, atoms and bits. 
as opposed to the, another app. I think you have an uphill against the wind battle with apps. Um, uh, it's really about the platforms. And so I, I find that for the most part, you're, you're getting stuck uh, in software world uh, with uh, narrowing use cases. Uh, the, uh, yeah, you know, the one I've used, my, my stock stump speech lie has always been, there's Uber, there's Uber for food, there's Uber for pizza, and oh look, a pitch for Uber for pepperoni. <laughs> and you're like, okay, you know, and by the way, there's value here. And, you know, to, to any founder out there, you can make a living at that, right? But uh, you can be a profitable company, but are you an investable company? And that's, mm -hmm. a, um, you know, that's, you know, a, a way to, you know, the way to look at it uh, is there are a lot of companies out here, but if you're coming at us as, as an investment group, you got You have to have some scale here. Let's continue with uh, the trend of giving guidance and advice to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a number of investors in, in this room behind that same microphone. And one of the questions that I like to ask, maybe sometimes in different ways, is as an investment group or an individual, you're looking at a product or a service or whatever it might be, but you're also looking at the founder or founders of that company. How much of the decision-making process is based upon what the business model is versus who the people are? Um, that may or may not have the likelihood of getting this across the line. So maybe yeah. it's a really fantastic idea, but the people aren't there, or it's the reverse right. way around. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit like talking about religion or politics. Uh -huh. um, the uh, the answer is is uh, sure. Any of those can either lock you in or knock you out. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you can. I mean, one of the first things you look at uh, is, I, I guess, is you know, I'll call it team product fit. Right. That's how I view it. Which would be, you know, I ran a bagel bakery and now it's I'm doing jet fuel, right? And you're like, okay, who's your advisors, right? <laughs> Somebody here has to be, you know. Um, and so I know a lot about jet fuel, just in case you ever need oh, one. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I do like bagels. Yeah, private jet. I'm one investment away from a private jet. The uh, so so I I don't know I you know you, you can't really separate them because mm -hmm. you can also take a, an A team. Uh, with a bad idea and have them waste three years of their lives, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, so yeah, I don't know that you can get away from any of it. And then the other thing is you can have them, it's a great idea in a, you know, in a small world. So they also did it. They built a, a nice small company that's naturally constrained. So then you say, well, they're such a great team. They'll figure out how to pivot. Well, I don't want to invest in pivots. Pivots sound like the kind of thing that, you know, is going to dilute our ownership. You know, I won't get into all the math. Reminds me of that Friends episode. Pivot, pivot, <laughs> pivot. You remember that one? <laughs> the couch. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't know that I, I really find you, you got to be able to look at it mm -hmm. um, in totality. But I would say, you know, actually one of the things, if you go out to the New World website, we've got a, uh, actually I wrote a blog post. And it was, I actually went through, I'm a big fan of Evernote, right? It's since the day it was invented, I so I track everybody I talk to, and you know, so we went back through, or I went back through with a glass of wine, <laughs> maybe two, <laughs> um, and and basically went, okay, what are all the reasons we did not invest in these mm -hmm. as, as a VP of screening for for New World? And um, I started just categorizing it out, and you know, you ended up being product team fit is one of them, meaning I I just don't know that you've got. Uh, the, the energy and you don't have the advisors to, to get you into this industry. Um, that's one. But more often than not, you get stuck with incrementalism, right? Uh, it's like this is 10% better than whatever's out there. But, you know, but the cost of change is 11%, you know, that kind of problem, right? And so uh, you see a lot of derivative ideas, kind of like I said with the Uber. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff you're getting now, especially um, in, uh, especially in the, um, uh, and information technologies ends up being that it's just not interesting enough. Um, the the other way to look at it is it's just uh, the, the addressable market's not big enough, and so you look at it and go, no matter what you do here, or there are six companies in the world that could possibly buy this, um, and so you've got you know you have just all sorts of I'll call it outsized risks. So it's um, it's a it's a difficult thing, but those those end up being the top. Uh, that you you end up on. You can go into other things like scalability of the mm -hmm. of the business model and things like that. But if you're not fishing in the right pond, what bait you're using and everything kind of gets to be secondary. Mm -hmm. You gotta you gotta show structure. The, the one of the interesting things for me is is that a lot of folks don't take addressable market seriously. Um, now you don't hang everything on. So I'm going into the the aircraft you know industry and it's a trillion dollar industry. Oh okay, um, super. 
but your product is, you know, seat belts, right? Mm-hmm. So how many new airplanes, how many new seat belts, how many new, you know, this kind of problem. So your real market is the market for seat belts and how do you make that all go? Um, and so, because the only reason that is, is that that actually drives your valuation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that you're in a trillion dollar industry, it's that you're in a, you didn't define your industry properly. And so we can't see how big this is gonna be. So we'll always ask how big is this gonna be and at what margins? And so a lot of folks don't you know, really think about that. And then the second question of that would be, what does this look like in five years? Mm-hmm. Most angels are gonna be in three to seven years, right? Um, from a you know, really illiquid investment. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at it, you, you look at the back end of that and say, well, will there be a seat, seat belt industry in, in five years? Or mm-hmm. are the, the seat industry going to take over the seat belt industry mm-hmm. and leave you out in the cold? Or can you sell to them? You know, these kind of questions happen where as an investor, you've got to look at this and say, hey, um, what's it look like in five? I, I get it today. You, you have the ability to sell a seat belt. Um, five years, you know, what happens, right? And I think as a founder, you need to be thinking that through. If not only just for investment reasons, but for your own reasons, but don't spend five years to get run over by a truck, um, uh, you know, in that you know, really you weren't defensible. Mm-hmm. That, pl- that applies very much, by the way, to AI, uh, if you begin looking at AI. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> um, you, uh, in, in, and I know you're, you have tremendous humility on, on these things, but, you know, Ron is one of those individuals that when I see him uh, join a panel, I'll actually tune in because uh, of his knowledge and expertise. He's going to give somebody a hard time. Because of his knowledge and expertise. So Mm -hmm. he actually understands, you know, the the concepts of tech because he's lived it and you've worked in it. You've you've had great tutelage and and sharing some of that. So let's talk tech for a moment now. Obviously, this surge in AI uh, revolutionary fourth industrial mm-hmm. revolution, mm-hmm. Uh, potentially uh, job displacement advancement, some scary components of AI. Um, you're seeing a lot of companies in this space uh, mm-hmm. now. The AI like of this. everyone. Yeah, you, <laughs> you mentioned uh, you mentioned a few years ago of the, the Uber of X. Now yeah. it's oh, uh, we have this with AI, and right. this is AI. So. Talk a little bit about what your per, uh, perception is and uh, looking at a crystal ball. Where is this going uh, today? What kind of impacts are, is, are we going to be facing shortly? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to predict the future. Let me tell you what's coming at us, Okay. which theoretically represents the future, I suppose. Um, so let's carve up the investment landscape for AI. So if you if you look at it, you can either invest in, I'll call it the computer science platform capabilities of AI. Um, that's everything from GPU chips up uh, and, you know, and all of the tool sets that we required, the base models, et cetera, the software, the hardware, right? Mm-hmm. You got this. And then you've got the applications of AI, mm-hmm. all right? So let, let me separate it out. Let's talk about the infrastructure first, the computer science. Um, that's computer science. There's a lot of change going on. And I would argue that when it comes to like LLM models and all of this, that from our, our basic thesis is, is that is moving towards open source in general. However, there will be probably a half a dozen big platforms that everybody's going to sit on. You know, you can name all the big players, the Googles and Microsofts and everything else. The, um, and so let's just say there's a whole infrastructure industry and that's a whole investment thing. We have not spent a lot of time on that. I think it ends up being, um, that is one area where I think Silicon Valley is gonna hold a lot of that core for a long time. The, the, the question then becomes, okay, we're now investing in the application of AI into stuff. Mm-hmm. And when you start talking about that, you start, you start looking at it, and there's obviously a business value, what's the reason? But the, the number one thing you have to be super careful of is, I, I'm gonna build, you're, you're gonna hear somebody say, Hey, I built this in 90 days, and now I can, you know, do your travel booking, right? Or you know, pick your pick your story, and and look at my beautiful app, right? Um, here's the thing: that is a wrapper, that is a veneer. The fact that you could build it in 90 days means somebody else could build one in 89 days, right? No real or friction 91. barrier to entry there, right? There's no barrier <laughs> to entry, but there's something else. Um, and so when you look at that and you say, well, where did you get your data, right? So number one, there's, as a wrapper, you don't have a lot of barrier to entry, but also you're training somebody else's model. So you're using an LLM from somebody else, right? So 
anytime when we're investing, we're looking, we're saying, well, okay, what's the tech stack here? And if you're using uh, somebody else's model, um, who owns the training on this um, at the end of the day? And so you're going to look for a federation uh, structure to say, listen, do, do I get my own um, uh, my own thing or not? The so what all of these are are essentially presentation layers, engagement layers, if you will, on on models. If you go down, then you've got those those LLMs, but then the layer below that is all of the technology for ingestion of, of data into the models. So the real question, I think, if you're to pick a thesis as an investor right now, and I plan to change this, I'm sure, a year from now, but um, is the real question to ask with artificial intelligence is, where are you getting your data, mm -hmm. right? Because if it's somebody else's data, they can go take an open source model or they can, f and, and so if you're busy buying data to train your models, so that's the first thing is, do you have a moat based on your access to proprietary data? If you do, if you are, for example, a scanner company for uh, you know, x-rays or something, and you put x-ray on top, well, it's your data coming off your machine into your, um, and so you have to say to yourself, the person with the data control is going to actually be able to maintain this, uh, maintain a lead, if you will, over time. Look at Teslas. Teslas are busy collecting data, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Tesla's a special case because if you look at Tesla, there's two types of data. I can train, um, I can train an AI to recognize a tree. Mm -hmm. Once I've trained it to recognize a tree, there's no more moat, right? Or there's no more leverage. Anybody can train to the tree and it's static. However, driving dynamic situations, there's lots of training over time, there's lots of capability. Those are two different investment decisions uh, you know, and how you can end up doing this. So, you know, there's just a, there's a lot of moving parts in this right now. And so you need to pay attention. If I would give you a thesis in AI, it's going to be a data thesis. Mm -hmm. Where are you getting your data? Are you in control of it? Is your data a moat? Um, and are you going to be able to sustain that moat over time? The, so you can also argue if you're using a normative model. So if you're using um, OpenAI's model, uh, you know, core model, um, all things sort of regress to a mean. Math nerd talk, right? So as you train things, you, you don't get more outliers, you get less over time. Mm -hmm. So then it begs the question, um, it begs the question of, you know, do you have a, a normative model? That, uh, you won't be able to differentiate the capabilities of what you have. Mm -hmm. So the other, the other thing that's going on is, let's just assume that these uh, LLMs continue to evolve very quickly. So this is the, uh, I'll call it the, the Amazon Web Services Roach Motel problem, mm -hmm. right? which would be if you go on to Amazon Web Services and you use this tool set and their tool set here and this tool set here, it gets harder and harder and harder to get off of Amazon Web Services, right? I think that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> that's by design. It's like me. I'm, I'm locked in, the, I'm locked in a Apple's trunk and I like it there, right? It's like the Big Mac and the secret sauce. It's the yeah. secret sauce that keeps coming back, that's not right. the Big Mac itself, right? Yeah. Just put it on a chicken sandwich. There you go. Yes. <laughs> the, um, so so what, what, you get, um, what you get now is you're going to have a bunch of rolling... Um, uh, uh, models, right, coming through. So how do you get portability? So the other interesting question is to talk about portability. Can you, in effect, take your training and move it to new models to take advantage of more capability over time? So there's a lot of questions. The, so if you're going to invest in um, an AI right now, in my opinion, in, on the application of AI, forget the computer science side, mm -hmm. application of AI, you need to be looking very carefully at the data question. Um, first and foremost, uh, in, from from a yeah. from uh, a person that is uh, as an investor looking at the business, and as a founder looking to get uh, a check uh, funding, that's something that should be explored and um, identified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, and there, there's something else, and and that is uh, one one last point on this it is, do you really have a product category? Listen, if everybody. Salesforce, every major software platform out there is busy building, um, is busy building uh, AI into their into their systems, and they have control of their data, <laughs> right? So if you have something that's an enhancement plugin to Salesforce, I'm going to ask you: Are you a new product category, or are you just a derivative product um, to you know other platforms out there? These platforms are all moving to implement AI in various for various forms and reasons. And so if you're looking, 
you're really not interested in a product that is an incremental uh, product. You're looking for a transformative product, a new product category um, that's leveraging AI where it never existed before and has self-standing data, back to my other point. So you don't want to get stuck. Um, you don't want to get stuck building what is basically a feature enhancement on Salesforce, to use them as the example here. <clears throat> so. We had somebody on the show recently that said, everybody's doing the same thing. They're all in the same vertical, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the blue ocean out there. There's yeah. go where it's no one's ever saying, gone before, yeah, right? That's book, the book, so yeah. What does that look like? The blue ocean? Yeah. Well, actually, if I knew the answer, I'd be investing. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, to me, the, yeah, I don't have a good answer because, so here's, we have those four investment groups, right? Yeah. Well, AI is showing up in the, every every one. We've got one that's basically, you know, taking you know, uh, antibodies and DNA, right? And, and parsing that. Well, that's one application of this. And, and you can go on and on. So the answer is, I don't think... I wouldn't view AI as a, I'll call it an investment category per se. It's a core technology for various use cases, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then where does it fit and how does it fit and what's a good use case? What's mm -hmm. a defensible one? Um, so I, that's how I would be parsing up the, 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 at least from an investor's world. So as a follow-up to that, mm -hmm. we talk about AI, but there's a lot of emerging technologies, those that we know of, those we don't know of yet. Mm -hmm. And referring back to the fourth industrial revolution that you mentioned, Jim, we're in this age of acceleration, mega disruption. What are the other emerging technologies that we should be focused on? And are they all linked back to AI or are they completely separate? Oh, no. Well, you're talking to a Bitcoin maxi. So let me back <laughs> into why I like Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. I'm not a heavy maxi. I'm just a uh -huh. maxi. Um, probably there, there's a couple of things that uh, around distributed architectures. So if I were to step all the way over... Um, or step all the way back and look at the tech industry. We have developed a world of platforms. Facebook is a platform. You know, mm -hmm. Google is a platform. You know, platform, platform, platform. That's another way of saying hub and spoke, mm -hmm. right? And guess what? In, if you're in the hub, by the way, you are um, at the control point of everything that happens in this world, right? Um, well, that's kind of a crappy architecture. Uh, number one is that if you're a dictator, it's probably a good architecture. But if you're not... You're like, gosh, you know, I've just inserted some sensor and in I can't call you up or send you a note without somebody having an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so that architecture is a problematic architecture. So there's this idea that from platforms, you go to protocols. So if you really look at what blockchain slash Bitcoin uh, is, it's a protocol. I can write a Bitcoin wallet against the protocol and be able to send you money per se or and digital gold, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it, Bitcoin, um, directly, no bank, no nothing. I'm a trust, by, by being able to hit the protocol, I'm a trusted intermediary. Um, there, you don't need a trusted intermediary. I can just move stuff around. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a distributed is a many-to-many -many set of connections as opposed to a hub and a spoke. Our banking system is a hub and a spoke. If I want to send you money, I'm going to send it to the bank, my bank over here, tell them to send it to your bank over there who puts it in your account over here. Now it's all direct. By the way, so, you had me at, you want to send me money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> you don't need um, any money. <laughs> so, so distributed architectures are, are a big deal. The, the other one that's, if, if you have some young founders who want to spend some time on tech, the other one is called Noster, which I always struggle with this. It is a notes and other stuff translated, transmitted by Relay. Hmm. And this is... Think, uh, think of a Twitter or a Facebook that essentially uh, all of my tweets, if you will, to use that terminology, are on my system. But instead of going up to a, a big you know, centralized platform in the sky, I can publish it to infinite nodes. Okay, And so those nodes basically are unable to shut it down. I can, I can go to infinite nodes, but then the other side, everybody else can subscribe to nodes. So you always have a channel into this world. It's a mm. mesh. Mm. And so there's no way to get it out. I mean, this is the Noster is uh, right now available. You can do apps like um, Damas is an app and uh, Iris and a few others. Um, but it's basically a messaging app that is completely decentralized. Mm. So that's a super interesting architecture if you're just thinking about tech in the next layer of Internet. Um, but really what they're doing, it's really just what Bitcoin is. So Bitcoin has the idea of, the miners, but also the nodes, the Bitcoin nodes, um, is this idea that Bitcoin is a protocol that you plug in. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And there's there's no way to turn Bitcoin off because there's no center, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is essentially a, a self-standing viral platform. And so to me, those are a couple of pretty interesting areas. If you're thinking in terms of really developing sort of next generation stuff, I mean, what Bitcoin is doing is is ultimately driving innovation into banking finance without without ever becoming money even. You know, it's, it's forcing a whole different look at how you in effect retain value um, and hedge against currency inflation really. You could see why mm -hmm. I enjoy listening to Ron uh, because there's tremendous nuggets of information. He's got a, an amazing background in, in tech. We've got a couple minutes left, Ron, and mm -hmm. I know we wanna talk about you know, you and Dina, your wife, have been champions. I was supporting uh, Florida Atlantic University's Tech Runway program and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, you have college students and so forth. Uh, how, you, how are you feeling? You've got uh, uh, some older children <laughs> now that are uh, um, uh, through Out college. Out of the house. That's right. Out of the house, empty, empty nester. Hey, no, nothing personal. <laughs> empty nester. I, how are you? How are you? How are you feeling about the educational system, uh, specifically in Florida? And uh, are you seeing, uh, obviously, with these accelerators um, like the Levant Center here at Nova, uh, are you are you uh, excited about what's uh, what you're seeing as far as the infrastructure and support educationally here? Yeah, I'm actually pretty encouraged. The I mean, here's the thing. I'll actually dial it all the way back to being a CEO. Um, and I was reaching out to universities. This is 25 years ago now, I guess, 20 years ago. Anyway. Um, and reaching out to universities saying, listen, I, you know, I would love to have some guidance, some support out of the university, um, whatever the case might be, you know, board of advisors and, and this sort of thing. And um, never could get it. It was never sort of in the mission of a university, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's one uh, data point. The other thing that I found was interesting um, is when I was with Ernst & Young, we were looking at, Ernst & Young does Fortune 500 consulting for the most part, right, mm -hmm. at the time. So, and up. Uh, and we were trying to, how do you move down market and begin to serve early stage, earlier stage companies, right? And we we're always, you know, the answer, by the way, is, because um, consulting firms are all like methodology and, and process and analytic tools, whatever. And the answer to this was, you really can't. Uh, you know, the early stage companies, they don't have money. It doesn't have an economic model to support mm -hmm. a consulting firm, et cetera, et cetera. So what, I've, what I saw in incubators, which I think is super interesting, is they basically have accomplished what universities wouldn't do, um, but also what um, consulting firms can't do economically, which is create a space for growth put a methodology in there, bring talent in to provide the guidance and find sort of, I'll call it a sustainable model. And so to me, that's a big leap forward. Now that's turned into a bit of a micro industry, right? Um, uh, so everybody's got an incubator and mm -hmm. you know, everybody sells a company and becomes an incubator, and mm -hmm. whatever, you know. So, but, you know, all that aside, that to me is all heading generally in the right direction. Uh, and so to the degree that a university can integrate not just the teaching and applied uh, side of it, um, uh, university, but kind of draw on the economic uh, side of the community, super stuff, mm -hmm. super stuff. The, the thing I would caution on it, and this is me as a tech guy, um, or actually it's not a caution. Um, if I were doing strategy, the not all innovation is the same when it comes to the community. Meaning what you really want is you want startups that import money into the region not simply the startups that recirculate money inside the region. So you want to be really heads up on, on sort of the kind of companies. This is something I can sell to the world, not to my neighbors, mm -hmm. right? Um, neighbors is good. It's not without value, but you got to make sure that you're reaching a little bit deeper. So I, I think net, I mean, Florida has profoundly changed, I think. Uh, you know, I mean, I, like most of the things, the buzz goes up and down, and there's too much buzz sometimes or whatever. But, you know, uh, you know again, you know, bullshit in macro, but in mm -hmm. micro, I think you know there's very specific uh, successes that I see at a founder level. So in the final moments that we have, best advice you've ever received and the best advice you've ever given. Oh jeez, there, there's your Rubik's cube <laughs> question, by the way. <laughs> so I say I'm thinking about my wife right now. What have you told me recently? <laughs> um, I would say best advice ever received. Um, As you're thinking about this, you can't say you know buy low, sell high. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine, yeah don't, don't be an idiot. You know? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, okay, that's a, I have a list of things, but let me just kind of return to uh, kind of CEO days, right? And one of the things that, you know, you're, you're what you find with a CEO is uh, you're, you're trying to get a company to go, you're trying to get customers, trying to keep employees, you're, you know, the list of things is long. And there's always somebody coming into your, to your, um, I'm gonna give you the counterpoint on this too, by the way. Um, you, you always have folks come to the office with an emergency, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things that, actually he was one of the, uh, I think he was the managing partner at, at Ernst & Young uh, for consulting. He said, um, the first thing you should do with every problem is decide whether there's a problem. And then the second thing you should do is decide whether you should do anything. Because urgency walks in your door constantly. Mm -hmm. And so your first mode of action is to probably not do anything and see what happens. Um, so you actually, because what you get, and you see this with founders too, in sort of retrospect, you see, you know, you're, they're bunny rabbits. They're, you know, everything, you know, this, that, react, 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 which you have to do to some degree. Um, it's sort of like if you watch uh, um, uh, Silicon Valley, you know, that's the you know, TV show. Mm -hmm. Crazy, that guy. But, you know, he, he's all over. So I, one of them was just to sit back and, and don't, over, don't overreact to things. Mm -hmm. Now, um, well, I'll give you the counterpoint. Because it's from Dina, my wife, <laughs> who would be, you take too long to make a decision. Or, you know, because she's very much, you know. Are, are you a Libra, by the way? <laughs> no, I'm a Taurus of all <laughs> um, So, you know, which would be, but, you know, my thing always was let something cook. And th that was just something because it creates a, a different wave. My wife would say I'm too, you know, make a decision faster, so. <laughs> you can watch this if she watches this. She'll, she'll know. Yeah, you she's nodding her head. <laughs> so, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Uh, so, the, it was the best advice you've ever received, and then the best advice you've ever given. Probably the best advice and decision was us selling our company when we did. I would argue we sold it a year too late, um, but you know, at the end of the day, um, it's because you're too slow. Well, because I have partners. <laughs> well, one of them was my wife again. She was one of the partners. But you know, the the idea of you know, kind of rationalizing how to go about some of that. I mm -hmm. guess that's. Uh, you know, I don't think I have a, yeah, I'm best guess. You know. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm sure your children can come up with a whole bunch as well. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> ask them. Yeah. We'll have yeah. to have them on a podcast. They, they actually know the term learning moment. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, well, Ron, I anyway. want to thank you for your uh, amazing time. I, you know, I shared earlier on in the podcast that there was going to be a lot of, you know, good points, good wisdom, some good tech talk. And I think we, we accomplished that today with, uh, with Ron Taro. And then uh, New World, thank you so much for all the work, you know, years of legacy, a lot of the changes that have taken place, uh, yeah, your, work in the, you. your work in the community, obviously obviously your mentorship and helping support uh, uh, college students and, and, and between you and your wife and the advice and support that you've given a lot of companies. Obviously these things help build communities, right? right. So uh, how, do, right. how do our startups uh, that are watching today, how do they reach you or reach uh, New World? Uh, New World has a website, newworldangels.com, and there's an apply for funding button, um, and you go in the queue. I, I think uh, if you were to reach us, I would go to our, our blog site, read our, a couple of our missives on the kind of stuff we're looking for and how we screen, and uh, you know, use that as a guide not to decide to apply or not, but actually to have a better uh, strategy for your company. Mm -hmm. your, your pitch deck that you come to a VC is um, ultimately... Uh, uh, not a pitch deck for a VC. It's your business strategy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, really tighten it up and make sure that it's, you know, because we're going to come from a, a different angle to look at you as a viable business. So I encourage you just to come in there and, and apply. We um, will try to, our, our members are around the state of Florida, uh, and we try to get to as many things. And many are mentors, some of them including in this, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, all good. And uh, by the way, my uh, congratulations to Levon and, and how this has continued to evolve. It's pretty cool. Well, we appreciate that yeah. uh, very much. And we welcome you back anytime. Uh, and uh, and for we're here for two. you as well. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes. So, uh, yeah. President, uh, New World Angels, Ron Taro, tech extraordinaire. Appreciate being on the podcast today. Thank very you so much. Pleasure, guys. Thank you. Okay. Remember to subscribe, like, and share the Sunshine Startups Live podcast and follow us on social media. If you're interested in sponsoring or appearing on the show, please email us at booking at sunshinestartups.live.